Everybody, it's good to have you with us. What a blessed day we have. Um, a little awkward right now because we do not have a worship team. They're all going up to the wedding. Uh, Aaron's last daughter is getting married this Saturday. And so they're up there getting ready. It's going to be a big thing up in the mountains. So anyway, we're going to give more time to Gino and... Um, I've mentioned this over the last few weeks, the different speakers that we have. Next week will be Ben Garati, so, but we're very, very excited to have Gino Geraci with us. He was pastor of Calvary Chapel South Denver for 27 years, about 27 years. He is on the board of Got Questions. Uh, it's the biggest on, with online Christian answering, Bible answering questions there is. So he's going to be open to doing a Q&A afterwards. So um, the children for children's ministry, you are now able to leave if they haven't left yet because um, you were normally going to be here for worship and then be dismissed. So the children are dismissed to the children's classroom at this time and you'll do worship over there. Um, but at this time, we're very happy to have Gino Geraci with us and his wife, Mary, all the way from South Denver. So um, let's welcome Gino Geraci. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, let's, let's pray first. Right. <clears throat> let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this beautiful day you've given us. Yes, Lord. Lord, what a glorious day that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. In all that we do, Lord, it's not just singing songs to you, Lord, but worship is just living our lives for your glory. May we yes, decrease, Lord. may you increase. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be open to receive all that you have for us from your amazing word. And we pray, Lord, that you would just bless Gino and give us wisdom and discernment and uh, great insight as he expounds on uh, the amazing Word of God, Genesis 1-1, and so we just commit this day to you, this night to you, and pray that you be honored in all that we say and do, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. amen. And so if anybody wants to know how to uh, speak, you need the interpretation of tongues, though, because he can speak about 50 different languages, probably? No, what he's, he's getting confused. <laughs> I can laugh in over a hundred different languages. <laughs> I can speak a few, but I can laugh in over a hundred different languages. I, I learned how to do this growing up in Southern California. We would go to Disneyland. <laughs> and ha has anybody here ever been to Disneyland? Many of you. So ha have you remember standing in line and there are people from all over the world. And so I would just sort of look at them and I would listen to them. Would you like to hear me laughing in just a couple of different languages? German is the easiest language of all to laugh in. Because all you have to do is just be disingenuous, like Raiders of the Lost Ark, and just go, <laughs> Russian. <laughs> what else? Arabian is, is, is kind of fun because you just go. All right, just a couple more. French, okay. You just go. Je suis un étudiant dans l'école secondaire. The two, the two fun ones are Japanese and Chinese. See, to laugh in Japanese, you just have to cut the last syllable short. If you're a Dodgers fan, you you get to watch their great pitcher. I love the Rockies, but every once in a while, I'm rooting for the Dodgers. I just, it's hard not to, but. In Japanese, you cut the last syllable short. So if you're at Disneyland and you see Japanese people, they'll go. <laughs> but in Chinese, you have to take the last syllable and stretch it out. So to laugh in Chinese, you just go. Why? <laughs> wow. 
All right, I'll stop. I'll stop. I am on the board of directors of Got Questions. How many of you have the Got Questions app on your phone or smart device? You should. GotQuestions.org is the largest Bible answer program in the world. Between January and September of last year, we got 85 million hits of every question that you can imagine. I do a daily radio program on the Salem Network, and um, so I've devoted my life to answering Bible questions. And one of the interesting things about gotquestions.org, on the question, how do I receive Christ as my Savior? How do I give my life to Jesus? There's a button that you click on, and 15 1,000 people per month are hitting that button. Shea Hoodman, who is the founder and director of Got Questions, asked a long time ago, can somebody get saved by just simply reading the, a gospel tract? And what do you think your Bible is? It's a gospel tract. And so turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to be talking about this first verse of the Bible. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, most of you know it by heart. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved across the face of the waters. You know, what's interesting to me is if you can believe the first line in the Bible, all of the rest of it becomes progressively easier. Because if the first revelation, the first words of the scripture are true, then that means that most of the world's answers have to be false. Years ago, I watched the first two installments of a Nova special called Origins. The host was a well-known astrophysicist, and according to the host, the universe began with an immense explosion, a big bang, and he assured the cameras or his viewers that the universe was about 14 billion years old in the last week. They sent the James Webb telescope into space, and now they're telling us the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. Stars formed and died, providing the raw chemical building blocks that occupy our solar system and our planet. The Earth is about four and a half billion years old, give or take a couple hundred million years. Life emerged, evolved, living, dying, spewing oxygen and carbon dioxide, multicellular life emerged, complex organisms, plants, insects, reptiles, birds, and then late in the geochronological timetable came mammals and man. The Nova Special made these great claims about how nothing became something, how something became the constituent chemicals that make up our periodic table, how those chemicals became living organisms, and those living organisms, get, organisms developed into complex biological systems, and how at least one person, the person watching the show, became conscious and aware, but not one single shred of evidence was offered to support those claims. Absent from the discussion was any hint of a creator or an explanation why the universe seems to reflect order, design, and purpose. And by the way, there are many different worldviews, but there are two large worldviews. A worldview is a way of looking at the world that offers an explanation for what you see. And in the two big worldviews that exist, one has to deal with a god or a deity of some sort, 
And one view is called atheistic philosophical materialism. Atheistic philosophical materialism is the idea that the universe is all there is and all there ever was. Most of you are too young to remember who said that. Yes. It wasn't Walter Cronkite, but he, they kind of talked alike. But in atheistic philosophical materialism, when you ask the question, how did nothing become something? Their answer, we don't know. How did something become everything? We don't know just yet. How did chemistry become biology? Not quite sure. The book of Genesis is really more than just a book on a, a handbook on beginnings. It's a careful revelation and explanation of everything. The book of Genesis is a book about God, and its themes are the origin of the universe, and the origin of life, and the origin of man, and the origin of sin, and the plan of salvation. And so people have constantly asked, is it allegory, poetry, myth? Is, is it true? Is the book of Genesis true? And in his remarkable book called the birth of planet Earth, Dr. Henry Morris lists several references in the New Testament that de directly relate to the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. In Matthew and Mark and Luke and in John, we're told that Jesus believed Moses wrote the book of Genesis. Matthew 19, 14 has Jesus telling us that God created human beings. He created them male and female. There are references to Adam and Eve and Abel in Matthew 23, 35. Noah and the flood, Matthew 24, 37. The genealogies from Abraham to Shem in Luke chapter 3, verse 34. The genealogies that now recede and go back through time from Noah to Adam to God in Luke chapter 3, verse 36. One time I got a radio, a, a program, a, a, a call on my program, and, and someone said to me, I don't believe Moses wrote the book of Genesis. And I said, Jesus believed Moses wrote the book of Genesis. Luke believed Moses wrote the book of Genesis. Paul believed that Jesus or that Moses wrote the book of Genesis. And I said, tell me something. Tell me your name. Steve. Where do you live? Highlands Ranch. Why don't you believe that Moses wrote the, the book of Genesis? And he goes, they hadn't invented writing. And I said, no, we know that writing was invented in at least 3000 BC. We know from cuneiform tablets, and we know that the Phoenician alphabet and Egyptian hieroglyphics precede all of those things. So, it would appear that Moses, if he was raised in the court of Pharaoh, had access to all of those things. One of my favorite New Testament passages in scripture is where Jesus is risen from the dead and on Easter morning, he's walking on the road to Emmaus. He's talking to a couple of disciples and he says in Luke chapter 24, verse 22, then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, but all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. The first 11 chapters of Genesis are vital in order to understand the next 1,178 chapters in the rest of the Bible. Genesis can be broken down into two basic sections, chapters 1 through 11, which cover creation, the origin of all things, the corruption, the sin of Adam, condemnation, the flood of Noah, confusion, judgment at Babel, and then chapters 12 through 50, which focus on the patriarchs in 
Abraham chapter 12 through 24, Isaac 24 through 27, Jacob 28 through 36, Joseph in 37 through 50. But make no mistake about it. When Jesus says, you search the scripture because in them you think that you have life, but they are those which testify about me. Jesus says that the book of Genesis is really about him. And so the themes of the book include blessing, cursing, the fall of humanity, the promise of a redeemer. And this is the book full of first mentions. It's the first mention of fear or being afraid in chapter 3, verse 10. The altar in chapter 8, verse 20. Belief, verse 15 through 6. Um, Blessing, blood, chapter 4, verse 10. Covenant, chapter 6, verse 18. And do you realize that the first mention of love in the Bible is Genesis chapter 22, where God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son, who you love to the place that I'm going to show you. It's impossible. It's impossible to understand creation. It's impossible to understand God's covenants. It's impossible to understand how God has related to humanity without some understanding of this book, with some knowledge of this book. The book of Genesis provides an account of creation that was not seen by human witnesses. And so there is this powerful idea, and the powerful idea is that God had spoke and revealed to Moses. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 11 says that God spoke in different times, in different places through the prophets, but he has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, part of what I want to help you understand from an apologetic standpoint or or from explaining, if you will, the Bible is that revelation, God's ability to speak, gives us the opportunity through reason to understand and apply that revelation. And so, you may believe that revelation is the least reliable source of information, but I'm going to suggest to you that that can't possibly be true. Do you remember when I was talking to you about Luke and Jesus rising from the dead and he's walking on the road to Emmaus? You would think, if he really wanted to convince people that he was the risen savior, all he would have had to do is just go, dude, it's me. Look, it's me. I'm risen from the dead. But he doesn't. He begins to explain in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He goes through the books of Moses and the prophets. Can you imagine walking that seven miles on that resurrection afternoon? By the way, it it would take about as long to make that trek as it is for my wife and I to drive from Littleton, Colorado to here. We're driving. And can you imagine having Jesus giving the Bible study? In the book of Genesis, it tells us how our universe came to be. The dispensations of innocence and conscience and human government and promise. Genesis provides the beginnings of the doctrines of God and Christology, or what my friend Arnold Fruchtenbaum calls messianic Christology, the promises of a Messiah and a Savior. And I believe that the revelation of the Scripture provides the thoughtful Christian with the best chance of understanding the universe, of understanding God, of understanding the human condition, of understanding salvation, of understanding human destiny. Did he 
Did Moses really write it? Again, Jesus believed that he did. John believed that he did. Luke believed that he did. Paul believed that he did. The Old Testament writers, when making reference to the Pentateuch, which is the Greek five books or the Torah, they cite Moses as the author. The Talmud, the earliest writings of the Jews, list Moses as the author. Moses was an eyewitness to the actual events that are recorded in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He was acquainted with Egyptian religion and language and culture. And Genesis contains more borrowed words from the Egyptian language than any other book. Norm Geisler came to our church one Sunday. I had the great privilege of of doing a couple of conferences with him. He was one of the great systematic theologians of the 20th and 21st century. In his survey of the Old Testament, he wrote, we can conclude that Moses, using the family records which had been passed on to him, compiled the book of Moses, or the book of Genesis. Jewish history shows the family records were kept passed on to later generations. Moses could have copied the material from records, just like Hezekiah's men copied Solomon's writings in order to complete the book of Proverbs. We know, again, that Moses was educated in all of the wisdom of Egypt from Acts chapter 4, verse 27. So the book of Genesis was was written to Israel in particular. But I'm going to suggest to you that, again, in this revelation, it's given to the whole human race in general. And in the Bible, when it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, it does not begin with a philosophical discussion, examination, evidence, or proofs being provided for the existence of God. It just simply says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Because the ancient people knew that you weren't a stupid idiot. (laughs) When you look out into the great big world and you say, what is that? You know that there's something there. And so... It assumes the existence of God. The book of Genesis not only supposes that there's a God, but that this God is all-powerful, knowable, self-existent, capable of loving, and capable of communicating. Three broad purposes can be gleaned. One is historical, one is doctrinal, and one is Christological. Historically, the book of Genesis was written to teach the children of Israel that there is a true and a living God who created all things, who prepares and purposes all things, and to teach Israel her roots, Abraham, the patriarchs, chosen by God for a specific purpose to be the revelation of God. I had Dennis Prager at our church, and I did a, 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 an event with him, and somebody asked me a question about the chosen people, and are the Jews the chosen people? And I suggested to them, yes, of course the Jews are the chosen people, but you need to ask another question. Chosen for what? Chosen for what? The Jewish people were chosen to bring forth the Messiah. What an amazing thing. They were the people who were the caregivers of the revelation of God. And so... Part of the point was to teach Israel the roots, and then the doctrinal purposes convey that God is sovereign, creator, Lord, majestic, intelligent, creator of everything that's visible and invisible. Many of you are familiar with Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17, where Paul writes and he says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn, Prototokos, over all creation, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth that are visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. 
According to the revelation of the Bible, you exist because Jesus exists. You were brought into being. Not just simply to exist, but to have a friendship and a relationship with him. The doctrinal list that I have here is by no means exhaustive, but it should include the realities that God created human beings for personal friendship and fellowship and service. And you are living in a world that's going to suggest to you that that's not true. You live in a world where the Bible says that there's a creator, that God created human beings, that they're made in the image of God, that they're male and female, that it is God who invented marriage. And it's God who understands the tragedy of sin and has made a provision for a savior. Genesis teaches about God's mercy and grace. But Genesis also teaches about this reoccurring theme. And the reoccurring theme is that human beings have this almost uncanny ability to turn their back on God, to rebel against God, to question God's goodness and God's grace, and God's forgiveness. There is a Christological or Christ-centered purpose. And part of it was to teach the promised seed that would point to Jesus as the promised one from the godly line that would begin at Adam, continue with Seth and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Judah and then David so that when you're reading your New Testament and you discover that the two favorite titles that, that Jesus has for himself is that he's the son of man because he identifies with you in your humanity and the son of David because he's the son of promise. And so in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Do you realize that these are just seven Hebrew words? Now, that might seem unremarkable to you. But if you ever get a chance, you should do a little bit of a study because the number seven reoccurs with what seems like an uncanny, ordered revelation. In other words, it would appear that the way that this book was written and then recorded and preserved, it bears the marks, I'm going to suggest to you, not of a human origin, but of a supernatural origin. The first seven words, number one, Bereshet. Number two, Elohim. Number three, Bara. Four, Eth, five, Shamahim, six, Eth, seven, Edits. In the first sentence, again, if you believe this first sentence, everything becomes progressively easier. I had a person call me on my radio program about whether or not a person should be buried or cremated. And they said, if I get cremated, how... How am I going to come back to life in the resurrection? I go, that's a great question. Because imagine you're turned to dust. Imagine it goes into the ground and the grass grows and a cow comes along from Grand Junction and, and somebody milks the cow and then somebody drinks the milk and then your molecules are scattered all over the universe. How in the world is God going to find you and put you back together? And the right answer is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And if God can create the heavens and the earth, is it possible to reconstitute your DNA from the smallest particle that exists? Absolutely. 
You know, I often get asked all kinds of questions on my radio program. One of my favorite is about dogs. A person calls me and says, you know, I really love my dog. Will my dog go to heaven? And I said, look, when you get to heaven, just call him and see if he comes. <laughs> yeah, I went for the laugh and I probably shouldn't have. Because there really are people who really love their animals. And they want to know. And that's an unsatisfying answer. And the answer that I had to wind up giving them was, we don't know everything about everything, but we know that God is an amazing God who creates all kinds of living beings. By the way, if you look out in the world in which you live, are you left with the impression that whatever kind of God God is, that he's an amazing God who seems to take joy and delight in all kinds of living creatures. And we don't know everything about everything, but there seems to be animals that exist in the eternal state. The Bible says the lion will lay down with the lamb. It says that a child will play in the open pit of a viper. And in the book of Revelation, when Jesus comes, he comes on a... Is the horse from here? Or are there stables in heaven? <laughs> Haven't you ever wondered if the Bible is just a collection of stories fabricated to bring meaning into a world that people will try to tell you doesn't really have meaning? Have you considered Freud's claim that religion in general is a kind of wish projection or Marx's claim that it's a kind of mass sedative to weaken human resolve or Stephen Hawking's famous statement that religion is a myth for people who are afraid of the dark and I couldn't help but think when I heard those words in the book of Genesis it says that God separated the light from the darkness. that God himself is present everywhere. Haven't you ever wondered if God is really there? Does he or she or it really care? Francis Bacon wrote, quote, if a man will begin with certainties, he will end in doubts. But if, it, if he's content to begin with doubts, He'll end with certainties. My friend, Dr. Walt Brown, who has an earned PhD from MIT and who taught computer science at the University of, uh, at, at the United States Air Force Academy, said, quote, no scientific theory exists to explain the origin of space, the origin of time, the origin of matter, since each is intimately related to or even defined in terms of the other, a satisfactory explanation for the origin of one must also explain the origin of the others. He said naturalistic explanations completely fail, unquote. So the Bible begins without apology, that God created the heavens and the earth and the Holy Spirit seemed certain that this was self-evident. But there are those who would rather believe Darwin or Dawkins or Hawking than Moses. There are those who are willing to take the word of, of Moses as scripture, but in one sweeping statement, this Bible, in that statement, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If that is simply true, it dismisses atheism and polytheism and agnosticism. Moses makes clear that the God Elohim is plural in majesty, but singular in existence. There's a Shema in Deuteronomy that says, Hear, O Israel, Shema Israel, open up your ears. The Lord, Elohim, the Lord our God is one. It seems to be the plurality of majesty which allows for a plurality of persons, but it doesn't allow for a plurality of gods. If this is true, 
If this is true, it dismisses pantheism by separating the God of the Bible from creation. God isn't matter and energy, but separate and distinct from the creation, transcendent. And so again, in one remarkable statement, the foundations of philosophical materialism, evolution, naturalism, dualism, humanism, and fatalism disappears is destroyed but there are people you know some of them that don't believe this even for a minute years ago i did a funeral for a woman who lost her five-year-old daughter horribly to cancer and i tried so desperately to comfort her i told her that there is a good god that there's a god who will in fact bring her daughter back to life. And she looked up at me and she said, I don't believe you. I guess I'm just going to have to pretend like I never had her. Can you imagine how broken, how empty, how horrible your life would have to be that you would dismiss any and all forms of hope. Let's just think about this for a minute. Atheism demands that there is nothing supernatural. There is nothing guiding. There is nothing there. There is nothing that informs the created order. If atheism is true, if atheism is true, then nothing really did become something. But right from the start, the Bible insists that, no, there's a God. He's a personal God. He's the kind of God that can create the universe. He had, the universe has a beginning. Even our unbelieving secular science friends believe that. The Bible teaches that the God is a personal God, the kind of God that can, in fact, interact with the universe. Agnosticism tells us philosophically it's impossible to ever know whether or not there really is a God. And so to even have this conversation is kind of an exercise in the absurd. I had a person call me, committed atheist, said, I'm an atheist. And I said, that's great. I said, are you an intellectual atheist or an emotional atheist? I'm an intellectual atheist. Okay, well, let's make sure we understand what we're talking about. You say you don't believe there's a God. That's right. So let me make sure I understand which God it is, that, which God it is that you don't believe in. Is the God that you don't believe in, is this a self-existent, perfect, being who created the heavens and the earth whose description is given in the bible is that the Bi is that the god you don't believe in yes i don't believe in any god or gods at all okay let me just make sure i understand something are you god of course not so you don't know everything about everything Is there some place where you might go? Is there something that you might learn? Is there some corner of the universe that you might travel in order to find some evidence that might disprove your belief? What would you be willing to accept as evidence that there is a God. Paused. There's that deafening silence because the moment that he has to offer, this is what I would accept as evidence, then I would say, of course, what if that evidence exists? Now you're no longer an atheist. You have to become an agnostic. <laughs> I know, what a tragedy. The Bible teaches that God has revealed himself. 
that he has revealed himself and what he's done. Materialism suggests that matter and energy are the constituent elements that make up reality, and yet the Bible teaches that God is distinct from his creation, that matter and energy is not eternal. Naturalism claims eternality. The Bible teaches nature has a beginning. Science teaches that nature has a beginning. Dualism demands good and evil are eternally coexistent, and the Bible teaches that God was all by himself when everything came into existence. Marxism, cosmic humanism, ideological social justice all suggest that man and his mind are the measure of all things. But one sentence, one sentence in the Bible renders every false view incoherent the next word is bereshit the hebrew word is translated in the beginning several hebrew scholars have pointed out that the word tells us nothing about how it began just that it began In John 1, 1, it pushes the chronology further back. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That word, logos, in the Greek language is very interesting to me because it is a word in the Greek ancient world which could mean an idea or a thought, but it could also mean a word that was spoken. The idea being that you could think something and then you could say it. In the book of Genesis, do you remember what Adam's first job is? He names the animals. Do you know why he names the animals? So he could have something to do and because Rocky's baseball was unavailable? (laughs) No. He's given the task of naming the animals because the moment that you can name something, you can talk about it. The Hebrew word for word is memra. In the beginning was the word, the logos, and the word was with God, and the word was God. According to the Bible, Jesus is the express communication of God. It's my belief that language is an attribute of God. Let me tell you why. Because according to the Bible, the Father has always known and loved the Son. And the Father and the Son have always known and loved the Spirit. And the Spirit has always known and loved the Father. In other words, whatever and however God communicates, he nonetheless communicates, and that means he's always been able to communicate. And when human beings are made, they're made fully functioning and capable of communicating. And the reason why this becomes so important to you is because, again, you're living in a culture and a society that is going to suggest to you that words only have meaning that you assign to them. And nothing could be further from the truth. In other words we have an agreement in language that gives us the ability to communicate. And by the way, if I were to use two words to describe that one word communication, it would be shared understanding. In other words, it isn't just simply me talking to you. It has to be you talking to me. It has to be you understanding me and me understanding you. The second word is bara, which means created. And the word can only be used in relationship to the divine being. In the beginning, God created. In other words, this type of word in that particular context in that verse can only be attributed to God. The word is never ever in the Bible used in relationship to something that is human in origin or that can be fabricated by forces other than God. There are several words that are used in the Hebrew Bible that are exclusive to God alone. Again, Fruchtenbaum argues that it can mean to make something out of nothing, but it doesn't necessarily mean 
create out of nothing, that this is not to say that Fruchtenbaum believes that the universe was created from something. He believes the universe was made from nothing, or what the theologians call ex nihilo, but the same word is used to describe the making of Adam and Eve. In other words, when you look at the Bible and you look at the word, it's always used in some sense in which God is the one who's doing the fashioning. And so it's used three times in section one, Genesis one, verse one to, to chapter two, verse three. It's used about the creation of the heavens and earth in, in chapter one, verse 21, the creation of the living creatures in verse 27 of chapter one, the creation of man. It's used in five different ways very quickly in the scripture. Number one, creating the heavens and the earth. Number two, Jehovah creating the heavens, Isaiah 42, five. Um, creating the host of heaven, Isaiah 40, 26. The idea being that it is God who created the angelic hosts, the creator of the ends of the earth, Isaiah 40, 28, creating the north and the south, Psalm 89, 12. So time doesn't give me, allow me to go through all of the references, but again, I want to remind you of something. Paul the apostle understood that God created everything out of nothing In Romans 4, 17, it says, God, who calls the things that are not as though they were. Hebrews 11, 3, the writer of Hebrews says, the worlds were framed by the word of God, and what is seen has been made out of things which appear. So God is the creator of both the material and the immaterial world. And so the idea is matter and energy are things that wouldn't exist unless God existed. So this God, Elohim, creates, sustains. The creator has no beginning. Once again, the revelation doesn't attempt a philosophical explanation. And again, in Psalm 14, 1, it says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. When it uses the term fool, it doesn't mean a stupid person or a person who's intellectually incapacitated. It means a person who is void of moral judgment. The very fact that God is able to create in the way that he creates, again, opens the door to a number of amazing things that we discover about God. God is self-existent. God is self-sufficient. God is eternal and unchanging. And the final words in the verse talk about what he created, the heavens and the earth. Those are the constituent elements of the entire universe. Douglas Adams writes, quote, space is big, really, really big. You have no idea how mind-boggling, stupendously big space is. I mean, you may think it's a long way down the street to the chemist drugstore, but it's nothing compared to space. The number of stars in our galaxy is less than half of the number of the cells that are in the human body. In our universe, we have the visible world and we have the invisible world, the microcosm of insects, microns, the world of cells making up amoebas, zooplankton, social populations of brain, bone, skin. Below the microcosm comes the creation on the scale of the nanometer. The nanometer is one millionth of a millimeter. That's why it's called the nanocosm. Microbes, humans, planets, stars are built from the nanocosm atom by atom. What Einstein said is true. So laws of physics are everywhere the same. (laughs) Einstein was amazing. He was on a train from Boston. And he lost his ticket. And the conductor came by. And he says, tickets, please, tickets, please. And Einstein's under 
the seat, looking desperately for his tickets. He goes, I can't find my tickets. I can't find my tickets. And the conductor says, Dr. Einstein, we know who you are. He goes, I too know who I am, but I just don't know where I'm going. (laughs) You can be really smart and sometimes miss a few things. At the same time, basic electrodynamics predicts that at the sub-nanocosm that it can be determined down to 18 decimal points. In engineering, this is called Cook's constant. High energy physicists don't know how it works, but there seems to be some evidence that there is a point with matter and energy that you come to an irreducible moment where reality loses its place, if you will. In other words, it becomes nothing. We don't live in an infinite universe. We also don't live in an infinite regression in the nanosphere. And so we're left with this amazing idea. What lies just beyond the last place that you can go in the universe? And what lies at the last place where you can go at the subatomic level? In Colossians, Paul says that Jesus is there. According to the Bible, God is high and lifted up. He can go places where you could never go. But just because he's high and lifted up doesn't mean that he isn't present. That means he can go where you always go, where you always are. And so in the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth. Look, this is the place where the cosmic drama of of redemption unfolds. That's what makes this planet so important. My son is the pastor of Calvary Chapel in Rio Doso. And if you go just 15 miles down the road in Rio Doso, this is Lincoln County where Billy the Kid shot it out in the Old West. Do you ever like to go to places where historically important things happened? You live on the most important place in the universe. This is the place where God sent Jesus. This is the place where he sent his son to die. Everything that in the Bible exists, it was existing in order to bring us to the place where Jesus would come, where he would live and die and come back to life. Science can measure and define the laws that now exist, but it has no good, plausible explanation of how everything came into existence and even more disturbing, why it exists. But there's several reasons why atheism doesn't seem to fit the facts. George Smith wrote, quote, if atheism is correct, Man is alone. There is no God to think for him. There's no God to watch out for him. There's no God to guarantee his happiness. You're on your own. But if that's not true, if that's not true, then you'll never be on your own. I have a friend He's a very smart guy. He went to medical school to become a doctor. So he goes to college, goes to medical school, becomes a medical doctor, then all of a sudden he realizes that he hates being around sick people. (laughs) Can you imagine devoting your life and you discover you don't like to be around sick people? I go, what did you do? 
He goes, I became a pathologist. What? Yeah, I went back to school, got an earned PhD in pathology. Pathologists work with dead tissue. I go, how much dead tissue have you worked with? Tens of thousands of specimens of dead tissue. How many cadavers and dead people have you worked on? Hundreds. I go, did any of them come back to life? He said, never. And I said, are you a Christian? He said, yeah, I am a Christian. I go, how in the face of such overwhelming evidence could you possibly be a Christian? And he said, I believe by faith that God raised Jesus from the dead. William Lane Craig said, quote, Amazing as it may seem, the most plausible answer to the question of why something exists rather than nothing is that God exists. He's one of the most famous philosophers of the 21st century. Existence argues that God exists. We can argue about whether the act of a creator is the only logical or possible explanation for our being here. But I want to leave you with just one thing. I want you to think about it hard. What makes more sense to you? That matter and energy made your mind, or does it make more sense that some mind created matter and energy? Which makes more sense to you? Which becomes more likely? All of this is nonsense, by the way, except for one thing. If Jesus really lived, and if he really died, and if he really came back to life, then what he says about these important issues become the most important thing that we could ever know. And that, my friends, is the beginning of wisdom. And that, my friends, is why the most reliable source of information about what is real and true still comes from your Bible. Thanks for having me. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take questions. But don't ask me about if your dog will go to heaven. And void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Does that mean the earth was already there in some form before God shaped it? Or I'm going to suggest to you no, that the earth was, that, that can't possibly be true. Because that would mean that some other thing then created the earth which doesn't seem to be consistent with what it's saying, because it's saying, in the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth. And so it exists. What's even more mind-boggling, I think, is that God creates the earth in such a way and everything that exists in our universe in order to accommodate that planet. And all of the evidence seems to point to that. I know you guys had Dr. Jason Lyle. I don't know if he talked about, you know, how the sun's 93 million miles from the earth and the ordered design of the planet that you live in, the solar system that you live in, the, the, the relationship of oxygen and nitrogen, the, 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 the element structure, all of it points to some remarkable person at work to make sure that you're going to be here and you're going to be fine while you're here. All the way in the back. Use your big voice. Can you explain the Trinity? No one can explain the Trinity. 
because again, I, this is a revelation. This is a supernatural revelation. How is it possible that this singular self-existent being is three distinct persons and that the Father is not the Son and that the Son is not the Spirit? All I can explain to you is that this is what the Bible teaches, that there is one God. The Bible teaches that this one God is known as the Father. The Father is God, but also the Son is God and that the Spirit is God and that the Father and the Son and the Spirit retain all of the attributes of God and yet they're distinct. That when Jesus says, when you pray to your Father, pray this way, that Jesus isn't praying to himself. So there is a distinction And according to the Bible, this second person of the Trinity, the Son, acquires a second nature, a human nature. And so the Father, and and so let's just, again, do a, a thought experiment for just a moment. When the Bible says that God is the Father, in John chapter 14, he says, I go to my father's house. I go to prepare a place for you. Has there ever been a time when the father was not the father? In other words, is the father always the father? I'm going to suggest to you, if the father who is a self-existent being always existed, he's never ever not been the father. That means that the son has never not been the son. I've discovered that there are four things that are true. It was Mortimer Adler who was who wrote the it was the editor for the Encyclopedia Britannica. He wrote a, an article on truth in that Encyclopedia Britannica and he argued that truth in order to be true has to have two characteristics. It must be incorrigible, not subject to perfection. It must be immutable, not subject to change. And when I asked and answered the question, what exists that is not subject to perfection, that will always be perfect. It's it's never, ever going to be th- anything other than perfect or immutable. It's never, ever, ever going to change under any circumstance. I only found, well, four things that fit into that category. The Father, immutable and incorrigible, not subject to perfection or change. The Son, not subject to perfection or change. The Spirit, not subject to perfection and change. What do you suppose the fourth thing is? That's right. It's everything they say and do. When the father says something or the son says something or the spirit says something, it's not subject It's not subject to change, and it's not subject to perfection. And you see, there is going to be a gigantic pressure on you to not believe what the Bible says. And some of you will go, I don't believe it. But some of you will hold on. Some of you will stay true. Some of you will remain convinced. So yeah, the answer to your question, I don't know. Uh huh. Yeah, and so what's your idea or your thought on the gap theory? I'm going to suggest to you that the gap theory is incoherent because I believe that it exists primarily in order to accommodate a theistic evolutionary construct. In other words, the text itself doesn't require it or demand it. And by the way, I've got an article, we've got an article at gotquestions.org. If you go to gotquestions.org, type in gap theory. Also, uh, my friends at Creation Ministries International have a wonderful article on that. And Answers in Genesis have a wonderful article on that, outlining the strengths and weaknesses of the gap theory. The gap theory was very, very um, popular in the 19th and 20th centuries. But I think it's, it's fallen out of favor, and I think for good reason. I 
guess I'm done. Look at you guys. You... Well, thank you for having me. Okay, you can talk in the microphone. Yes. All right. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you again for having Gino here with us tonight. We pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to lead him and guide him. And may you continue to knit his heart together with Mary, and his wife, and knit their hearts together with your heart, Lord. May they continue to be a team that serves you, that loves you, that demonstrates the goodness and grace of God wherever they go. And Father, we pray that you'd continue to have your hand of strength and wisdom upon Gino. We pray that you would continue to bless him and use the gifts and talents you've given him for your glory. Yes, Lord. And Father, we thank you so much for this time together tonight. I pray that you would continue to lead us and guide us through your word by the power of your Holy Spirit. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks. And, and by the way, the, the app for gotquestions.org, free, free, F-R-E-E. -E. Did I say it's free? It's free. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> um, real quick before the, uh, is the high school kids going on? Okay. So the high school, middle school, youth group, you will be heading out over to your classroom here uh, to continue this discussion and other things going on. And uh, we just want to thank um, Craig and Jody and their life group team for giving us a great meal tonight. Praise the Lord. Um, Real, real servants' hearts. And uh, next week, I think I heard we're having shawarma. Oh, that's right? good stuff. Shawarma's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm cooking the chicken, so cool. Anyway, uh, God bless you guys. Uh, hang out. You can fellowship. If you got more questions, Gina will be here for a little bit. And uh, we're done early, so you guys are dismissed. God bless you guys. Have a great week with Jesus.